It occurred to me that we didn't have, it's, it's clear that we didn't have any commentary yet on medicine and politics. And, and I can't think of anybody qualified to do this in Beatrice Galam. She's an associate professor of medicine at UC San Diego. She's worked extensively on Gulf War illness and uh, with RAND reports. Um, she also heads the UCSD San Diego Statin Study Report and has also lectured extensively on the use of statistics and accuracy and evidence in medical reporting and papers. Okay, so we've all heard how important it is to apply evidence to policy decisions. Well, medicine is a sphere where policies are based on scientific evidence, or so, so we believe they are. Moreover, this is really a best case scenario. We have access to randomized control trials where we can manipulate the inputs and observe the outcomes. Randomized control trials are considered the highest quality evidence for causal inference. But repeatedly, in every sphere I've been involved in in medicine, I've observed that the policies in the form of practice dictates and consensus statements depart often radically even from the published evidence. How, I wondered, could this be? And for those of you not in medicine, what lessons can and should we learn from this about evidence where stakeholders are involved? Your brain on medical politics. There are a number of factors at play, and these are actually just a partial list at which conflicts of interest play a role, and we'll take a brief look at some of these. Well, first, in order to secure the evidence, you have to do the study. And in order to do the study, somebody has to pay for it. Well, in the case of drugs, the overriding source of money for drug studies is industry. And in one of my main fields, the effects of statins, all of the major drug studies are funded by industry. Next biggest source of funding is the National Institutes of Health. Well, that has been written by David Willman of the LA Times about entrenched conflicts of interest with NIH, although they have, between industry and NIH, although they've taken steps to somewhat redress this. But in contrast to the letter that some of you, or the article some of you saw in yesterday's New York Times where it claimed that the NIH takes important steps to restrict conflicts of interest, it is also the case that they take steps to ensure conflict of interest. We submitted a proposal or a letter of request to submit a proposal to look at actually an adverse effect of a statin and ways to mitigate it. And we were told by the NIH that they would not permit us to submit the proposal unless we asked the drug company to supply the drug, which is considered support in kind and a conflict of interest. Next down and far down on the totem pole are professional societies, which like you know, the American Heart Association, which are doctors groups and you therefore might think would be free of conflict of interest. But in fact, fact one analysis viewed the IRS records of a convenient sample of six professional societies over the previous year and found that their pharmaceutical company revenues ranged from 700,000 in that year to 18 million. And in four of the six uh, professional societies, the pharmaceutical company revenues exceeded often vastly the member revenues. So this is also not a sphere that is free from conflict of interest. But evidence is evidence, whoever the funder, right? Especially if it's done by academics. Well, we'll see to the, the degree to which that is the case. Well, of course, after your study is funded and has been conducted, now in order for anybody to learn about it, it has to be published. Well, there's evidence that bad results are selectively not submitted for publication or submitted as though they're good. In fact, one analysis found that pharmaceutical company funded studies were far less likely to be published than other studies, but oops, the ones that were favorable to the drug were not less likely to be published. And an example of this comes from an analysis that was published this year in the New England Journal of Medicine in which FDA officials accessed a number of trials of antidepressant medications. Now we have these clinical trial registries so that the FDA can access information even from trials that haven't been published. There were 38 studies where FDA officials viewed the findings as, as being positive, and of these, 37 were published. There were 36 studies where the FDA viewed them as having negative or questionable results. 22 of these were not published at all, and 11 were published in a way that conveyed the result as though it were positive. So that if one simply went to the literature, it would look like 94% of the trials were positive compared to about 50% that actually were, a difference between essentially unanimity of opinion versus a coin toss. Not only is it the case that bad studies are not submitted for publication, but there's evidence that good studies are submitted multiple times. So one analysis, a very carefully done analysis of randomized controlled trial data on a specific drug called ondansetron, an anti-emetic or anti-vomiting drug, 
found that 17% of published full reports of randomized trials and 28% of the patient data were actually duplicated. The fact that the same study was published as many as five times was obscured by the use of different author lists and differing study details. They had to look very carefully to identify that these were the same studies and that they observed that other reviewers of this literature had missed the fact that it was the same study being multiply published. Not surprisingly, trials reporting greater treatment efficacy were significantly more likely to be duplicated, and this duplication led in meta-analysis to an overestimation of the anti-emetic or anti-vomiting benefit of this drug. So published data are skewed relative to the truth. Can we get an estimate of perhaps how skewed? Well, one uh, study was entitled, Why Olanzapine Beats Risperidone, Risperidone Beats Ketiapine, and Ketiapine Beats Olanzapine, an exploratory analysis of head-to-head -head comparison studies of second-generation antipsychotics. And the finding was essentially this. Whichever drug was made by the study sponsor was the drug came out, that came out on top, or at least 90% of the time. And by the way, similar analyses have been conducted and shown similar effects for other classes of drugs, like non-steroidals and statins. Here we have the funding agency saying to the scientist, you're completely free to carry out whatever research you want, so long as you come to these conclusions. Well, I think this is less true of the NIH, but it appears to be quite true for drug company-funded studies, at least as suggested also by the next slide. In a multivariable analysis of industry funded, in this case, statin randomized trials, funding from the test drug company was associated with results and conclusions that favored that company's drug, controlling for other factors. So the odds ratio, meaning the, well, the ratio of the, the odds for that study's drug being better compared to the odds for the comparator drug being better were 20 to 1 for results and actually 35 to 1 for conclusions. So that even if you couldn't, come up with a way to make your results look better, you could still portray the conclusions as though your drug came out on top. Now here's an important question. If you have two approximately equal drugs from the same class where either one can be made to look better depending on who funded the study, what implications does that have for comparing a drug to another drug that it's no better than when that other drug is called placebo? And I contend that there are a number of instances in my own field where that's exactly what has happened. For example, the PROSPER trial, which is the sole randomized trial of statin use in the elderly, failed to find even a hint of a trend towards survival benefit, toward morbidity benefit, toward stroke benefit, and there was a statistically significant 25% increase in incident cancer in the people randomized, randomly assigned to statin relative to placebo. And yet the conclusion of that study was that these findings extend to the elderly the approaches used in middle age. This was a high-risk elderly population, and on each of those features I mentioned, they differed radically from findings in middle age. It was not necessarily so surprising to me that the abstract from that study, which was, of course, drug company funded, made that claim. But what stunned me was the follow-on literature, which had titles like Benefits of Statins in the Elderly, Underuse of Statins Among Older People. These are the editorials that follow from that study and were published sometimes in reputable journals like Lancet and JAMA. Initially, I was confused. Had these people read the same study that I had read? It took a while before I began to understand what the forces were that were involved. Some understanding comes to bear from several years back when there was a subclass of a group of drugs called calcium channel blockers, or CCBs, that were under scrutiny. And ultimately, it was found that the subclass of calcium channel blockers increased heart disease, and now we no longer use them. But during the time that debate came to the fore, somebody analyzed experts' published attitudes about these drugs and whether their statements were supportive, neutral, or unfavorable as a function of whether those experts had conflicts of interest in calcium channel blocker manufacturing drug companies or in any drug company. And as we can see, those with unfavorable attitudes compared to neutral attitudes compared to supportive attitudes showed successively greater prevalence of conflict of interest in drug companies. And these effects were very striking and very strongly statistically significant. The probability that this difference could have occurred by chance alone is less than one in a thousand. In fact, one could even be tempted to make the observation that the only way you could make supportive claims about this class of drug was if you had drug company conflict. 
Now, it is not only the case that there is submission bias where you restrict bad, bad findings from coming to the light of day and publish the good findings in duplicate and then have follow-on reviews with conflicted people that are favorable. But on top of that, or perhaps related to that latter factor, it emerges that there's this phenomenon called ghostwriting. And this has been shown not just for one drug company or for one class of drugs, but this phenomenon has repeatedly come out during the discovery process when there's litigation against drug companies, in this case against Park Davis, for pushing of off-label indications for their drug Neurontin. It was ascertained that Park Davis had contracted with these are medical education and communication companies, which were for-profit companies funded essentially exclusively by pharma to write scientific medical articles casting their drugs in a favorable light. The company got paid money per article, and the company in turn paid $1,000 each to friendly doctors and pharmacists to be listed as the author of the publication. The reader would have no knowledge that there was any involvement of either the pharmaceutical company or the MEC in this publication. An article published this year in JAMA based on the discovery process for Merck relating to the Vioxx litigation showed a similar phenomenon. For randomized trials, the paper would typically be, be written by somebody who worked for the company, and then they would find an academic to be the listed first author, who would, in fact, sometimes but not always list uh, an industry relationship. But for review articles, typically the person who wrote the article was completely unacknowledged and an academic was listed as the sole author and most commonly with no acknowledgement of any pharmaceutical company conflict of interest. So after you have this issue already of submission bias, well, it's got to go to a journal and the journal has the opportunity to accept or reject an article. It would be nice to believe that medical journals are bastions of truth and light, but evidence suggests otherwise. In fact, medical journals are businesses and rely not only on drug company advertising for their revenue, but also on the less recognized sales and glossy reprints of drug company favorable articles for which they can net $100,000 or more for one favorable article. And as has been observed by people who should know, like Dr. Richard Smith, the former editor-in-chief of BMJ, and Dr. Richard Horton, the editor of Lancet, medical journals have devolved into information laundering operations for the pharmaceutical industry. Most medical journals have no policies on conflict of interest for their editors, and as Smith said, publish a trial that will bring $100,000 of profit or meet the end-of-year budget by firing the editor who refused to publish the article. And the stakes are no longer low. A few journals that not long ago measured profits in the tens of thousands of dollars a year now make millions, according to at least three editors who agreed to discuss finances only if granted anonymity. And I'll just say, since this came out, um, since Dr. Nemiroff was named in, in the New York Times article yesterday, that he's sort of responsible for one of my favorite examples of conflict of interest. He was a lead author on an article in the journal on which he was editor-in-chief, where he and seven other co-authors failed to disclose that they were paid consultants to the company that made the device touted in the review, or that the article was actually written by the company itself. After this was... Um, outed by a, a, a reporter. He resigned as editor-in-chief. Um, but this is a nice sort of advanced maneuver. It combines thought leader influence, author influence, editor influence, ghost writing, and concealed conflict of interest all in one flourish. Sort of like the triple sow cow of conflict of interest. <laughs> so after the papers go through all this process of submission bias, and I didn't mention the issue of reviewer bias, and editor bias selecting at each stage relatively for the articles favorable to drug relative to those unfavorable, we have the issue of how the information is disseminated. And one mechanism is through medical education. Unfortunately, much of medical education comes through the filter of the pharmaceutical industry, and reliable estimates put industry's expenditure on promotion to doctors at $18.5 billion, about 30000 a year for every physician in the United States. Usually when I mention this to doctors, they go, where's my share? As has been observed, does anyone really believe that medical educators are properly doing their job when they allow the pharmaceutical industry not only to subsidize the educational costs, but also to help prepare the curriculum? The Accrediting Commission has actually accredited some drug companies and a number of these uh, MECs, which means they can actually develop their own curriculum, um, but also help prepare the curriculum, recommend and pay the speakers, pay students and residents to attend, lavish free meals and other favors on attendees, and then promote the company's products at the meeting. 
how might it be that the Accrediting Commission for Continuing Medical Education is so permissive to industry involvement? Well, perhaps it relates to the fact that almost half of the task force members are representatives of the pharmaceutical industry or consultants for businesses like these MECs that work with the industry in preparing educational programs. Only a few actually resent, represent academic CME institutions. And the next way that education occurs is through professional meetings. And sometimes it's merely the they're often extremely heavy, heavily pharmaceutical. I have to go short on time, so I'll just go ahead. I'll also say that suppose there is somebody who actually speaks up. What are potential implications to them? Well, there are a number of known instances in which there are direct threats, such as Dr. Buse, who presented data a long time ago about this drug, Avandia, that recently came to attention, showing potential harms. And drug company officials reportedly phoned him and suggested he could be personally financially liable to the tune of $4 billion in lost market capitalization for his remarks. Probably it's more common for drug companies to act through their academically involved minions, as in this example of Dr. David Healy, who actually accepted a job offer from the University of Toronto, then after he gave a talk there suggesting that Prozac may cause suicide, had his job offer rescinded. It might bear note that um, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health at University of Toronto had been funded by the manufacturer of Prozac to the tune of $1.5 million in recent years. Incentives in academics strongly favor industry. To get advancement, power, and space, you bring money to the university and publish large trials in big journals, goals that are most quickly advanced through drug company funding. When I did a debate at the American Heart Association several years ago, I sat across the table the night before uh, <clears throat> with my co-debatant, who apparently forgetting that I was sitting at the table, said to the person next to him, it would take four slides for me to really list all my conflicts of interest, to which she responded, if there's any company I'm not on the take from, come on over. That gives you a sense of the comfort level with conflicts of interest in medicine. And by the way, that woman, I looked her up, is the highest paid woman at her public university, which is why salaries are on file. Patient groups are also being funded and founded by drug companies with failure to mention where they get their money and then doing lobbying aligned with it. And I'll just say that these factors may seem like independent factors that each happen separately, but in fact there's evidence that the pharmaceutical company has is extremely conscious about their use. The um, um, Association for the British Pharmaceutical Industry, <coughs> it was discovered, had a memo in which they described their carefully thought out campaign in which their battle plan was to employ ground troops in the form of patient support groups that they found and fund, sympathetic medical opinion and healthcare professionals, which will lead the debate to weaken political, ideological, and professional defenses. Then the ABPI will follow through with high-level precision strikes on specific regulatory enclaves. If this isn't chilling in terms of how conflict of interest can affect policy, it should be. Similar factors are, are, are recognizably at play in other domains in which there are stakeholders involved. Those with big pockets have potential for more impact, but some of these practices can occur even without deep pockets. And I'll just say that the sort of candles are be prepared, be aware, um, learn at least five of what are often called the 40s, but with a different set of fours involved, about practices that are used by industry to try to discredit those who are speaking the truth, and most of all, train yourself and others in evaluation of evidence and inference. Thank you.